уважаемые коллеги, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear guests who get, get together in the room, I would like to get started, I'd like to open this event, and I would like to say a couple of words in advance. Today is a wonderful and unusual day. This is the first day of a small biological victorium, big biological lecture hall. It's our child, the child of the Faculty of Sciences of Life. The 20th century was the century of physics. I believe that we can say that the 21st century, this is the century of biology. And biology doesn't do the same. It is not the same biology as the previous centuries. Naturalists and biologists, they are getting changed by all the specialists. And this lecture hall, I believe that this is an attempt to speak about it's very important challenges which modern biology faces. Have a look at modern biology with new opportunities, new technologies, with big data and data processing analysis. And I hope that big biological lecture hall will become a big platform, a fruitful platform for discussions and will attract young people to this very interesting and essential topic and area of knowledge that is called modern biology. We have a array of different events. The whole information you can find on our website. Please have a look, sign up for the news. And uh, we had an attempt to reflect on the most important and interesting topics of biology. The meeting of today will dedicate it to the city. This is the situation we all are located. And I believe that this is the right time just to understand whether our approach is the correct one. Maybe there are some different approaches to the point of view of biology. And today I would like to introduce our highly esteemed speakers. Today I'll have an honor to conduct this discussion. First of all, Stefana Serafini, good day. I hope that you can hear us. Hello, thank you very much for joining us. We're very glad to have you here. Stefano is an Italian philosopher and psychologist, co-founder, principal secretary and director of research of the International Community of Biourbanism, editor-in-chief of the journal Biourbanism, the author of publications on Biourbanism and Peer-to-Peer peer -peer peer. I hope that we'll be able to listen about this topic. Very glad to see you here. Next to me, Alexander Asmolov, he will the moderator of today. And uh, very soon, Alexander will start the moderating this event. I wanted to introduce to first of all, so he's the professor, the academician. He teaches at the Moscow State University, the director of the Russian Institute of Economics. Also today with us, we have two guests, two experts. First of all, Natalia Ivanovskaya. Thank you. Very glad to have you here. She is an architect, psychologist, and expert of the Ministry of Construction Program. She's also the author of different programs according to different methodologies dedicated to comfortable environment from psychological point of view. And Irina Teranet, very glad to have you as well. She's a conservation ecologist. She's also a senior researcher at the Museum of the Earth Sciences at Lomonos of Moscow State University, lecturer in various environmental disciplines and developer of interactive lessons and educational games, participants in various scientific and educational grants. And me, I'm the host of today's meeting, Olga Svarnik, Dean of the Faculty of Life Sciences and Head of the Department of the Moscow Institute of Psychoanalysis. I research brains and the processes of cloning and memory. I'm very interested in this 
topic from my perspective. I hope that we'll be able to touch upon that. Thank you. And now I give the floor to Alexander Asmolov. Thank you, dear friends. <clears throat> Olga just mentioned that today this is the beginning. The beginning is taking place in this audience, in this hall and it is named as a biological lecture hall and maybe it can be regarded as the hall of life sciences when we talk about life sciences we change the optics we change the vision the problems itself and then suddenly we dwell upon the next things how from the point of view of the optics of life of life sciences we can observe cities those cities are changing in the evolution of human being populations with their organs and bodies which participates in this construction works why do we have different solutions how can we consider a city being ecological one we can have different approaches according to the sciences from psychology anthropology and many other how do we have very strange names maybe from Zinoviev? Maybe my colleagues will help me because it's very difficult to pronounce those terms. How can we interpret cities? They can remind us like buildings of termites, for example. So it means that we have a very wide range of questions and there are so many ways and journeys to discover these questions. From the very beginning, I mentioned Mary many times that when we try to discover a phenomena we can be trapped in the tower of babel because biologists might mention one thing psychologists might mention other things architects well they might cover a third topics and they can look at each other and just don't understand each other what is it all about what are you talking about the today's project is an attempt to find the translation in order to be able to understand each other just to understand each other better what is it all about why the problems of city <clears throat> we can find some publications some books but anyway we will have an attempt to understand the influence of the city on our lives on our emotions and feelings and i'm sure that my colleagues might name a very wide range of researchers so i think that Olga also introduce our foreign friends and we have our foreign friends here he's a master of different researchers of different associations so his voice for today is very interesting just to be able to see another perspective and other optics for many of us maybe it is unknown still it was not discovered that is why all together let's have this attempt as olga mentioned let's try to stop this egocentrism and monodisciplinarity in each of the fields and only then we will have success if we will be able to avoid this egocentrism and uh, use the language of um, psychoanalysts stop being narcissistic because every science loves itself biology loves only biology architecture loves only architecture and they cannot hear each other Please speak closer to the microphone, pardon me. Okay, so we'll try to talk to each other. And I would like to um, say that biology is the science when people can hear each other, whether it will be successful or not. It depends up to us on our intellectuality and we will work together in this direction so that is why olga the floor goes to our colleague who looks at us very attentively by the way from the screen i look at him and i can stop watching him because you know he's like a copy of the rector or the dean of the institute of psychoanalysis just the same 
please. The floor is yours. Stefano. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank you for this invitation. I am very fond of talking to the Moscow audience. I'm much in love with your country and your culture. I will speak in English, unfortunately, because my Russian is not so good. Um, the introduction is very at the point. In fact, my urban is exactly that. I'm not an architect, I'm not a biologist, but it happened to me to work with biologists and architects in the last 20 years. And uh, I found uh, a lot of connection between the two, the two fields. And what I do essentially is putting together people from different, uh, different culture, different backgrounds, come together and work in the field of uh, urbanism. Um, in this little uh, talk, I will, I will speak about uh, the point of connection that, according to me, is most relevant now among urbanism and science and city and biology. And I go back to the year 2000, when the famous biologist, the technobiologist, Craig Bentham, together with the physician Francis Collins of the National Institute of Health of the U.S. Public Genome Project, announced the mapping of the human genome. U.S. President Bill Clinton and UK Prime Minister Tony Blair accompanied them during the presidency. Ten years later, Venter announced nothing less than the creation of artificial life, as his research group had engineered a sequence of DNA and inserted it into a bacteria. The media buzzed up followed, at least in the Western countries, was useful. However, as usual in these cases, did not correspond to reality. As you all know, the RNA molecules reproduced by the DNA mechanisms are not distinct. Molecules per se cannot self-heal, cannot develop, cannot duplicate without the entire complex molecular architecture or metabolism, thus involving enzymes, proteins, etc. Allows life to Further, Venter did not even design a clone of the engineering of the DNA. He copied it from a mycoplasma. Therefore, one may think boasting the creation of artificial life was nothing more than a marketing expedient. In the end, Venter made a lot of effort to make money out of his research, for example, by trying to patent human brains in space. In fact, such a magniloquent expression corresponds to a die-hard mainstream biological system that is that the gene is at the center of life and that it works as a linear machine. So we got this theorem, no? One gene, one protein, one protein. Venter is an emblem of such a machine which literally wasted billions of dollars in mapping the entire human genome for establishing a gene-based medicine. Antonio Lima de Faria, the father of cybernetics, professor emeritus at the University of Lund, Sweden, used to tell me that the gene-centric theory of evolution cannot be openly criticized in any NATO country. And he was right. His seminal work, Evolution Without Selection, has been translated into Russian, by the way, explains how genes appear late in the history of evolution and catalyze processes that existed long before them. The complexity of physical and chemical forces at work in the phenomenon of life cannot be reduced to the magic bullet of gene as the sole causal principle of life, as Professor Giuliani put it. Cities are often compared to organisms, and the expression city life is an everyday truism. What matters in such a metaphor, though, is the meaning of its terms. If we mean life as a mechanic process, then saying that cities are organisms or machines would be exactly the same thing. The famous urbanist Le Corbusier, in fact, used to define houses as machines for living in, machine habitat, French. My friend Professor Yap Dozen from Delft University instead says that a house is not a thing. Uh, because a house defines the innerness that characterizes you and me as living beings rather than objects. Um, the house delineates such an innerness by allowing for a complexity of physical and semiotic processes. 
processes, uh, we cannot reduce to a simple mechanism. So does a city that reflects and nourishes the vitality of its own community. Unfortunately, cities increasingly often fail to do so. Noticeably, like in the gene-centric model of biology, the mainstream pseudo-biology of urban studies is economic center. You may have listened to the rhetoric of bringing life to cities by way of financial investment. It is a mantra in the Anglosphere, unfortunately in Italy too. However, you and I know very well that a city with no beauty, no social life, no generosity, no spirit and no history is not really a city. These qualities emerge through a common self-built civic language, a communality of interest and systemic unity. Money has only a modest share of it. Most of modern settlements may be huge, exciting commercial centers, warehouses or labor force or consumers, financial hubs or cemeteries in disguise, but they are not alive. What I want to stress here in this short time given to me is that biurbanism is the discipline of designing cities of life in the sense meant by Yap Dozo rather than that of Le Corbusier and Venta. We have studied the complex urban codes that allow the flourishing of beautiful traditional cities throughout millennia with Professor Bezimakin from the US and their interaction with natural laws and ethical principles. We have found how the landscape is the umwelt and the language of cities and how cities build their own landscape, the way living organisms produce their own biosemiotics. This is with Professor Sergio Loss from Italy. We have seen how the Venter model literally killed cities and how an acknowledgement of the complexity of life can heal scarred urban organisms. And the best teacher in this has been Marwa Al-Saboni, an architect in Syria. Our model merged biophysical functionality, historic ethos, and adaptive progress, providing for the emergence and unfolding of civic language, which is key for any connection to the life world. Some authors have interpreted biurbanism literally in a very naive way as introducing biological organisms to the city. They think that the biurban city must be full of plants and animals. Sure enough, animal and vegetal life can have a role in making a city more alive. However, these authors miss the point that humans are living beings themselves and capable of giving life to their artifacts, if only they tune to their own natural and social complexity. But if we keep considering ourselves as machines, we cannot help but build alienating landscapes, even if we keep putting trees on top of skyscrapers. Life is a dynamic autonomy with intentionality a vectoriality capable of fitting to the environment and adapting to the environment. In urban terms, life is a political project. The word politics comes from the Greek word polis, it means city. Embodying the biosemiotics of landscape. It embroils biophilic and bioclimatic architecture, that is design that connects to nature and the way our system works with it, our ergonomics. It owns and manages the eight institutions that are all required to make a city autonomous as organs make an organism alive, namely, according to Sergio Laws, shelter, agriculture, materials, tools, energy, information, transport, and waste. It is worth noting that most of these eight institutions are nowadays depending on entities that are external and outside of the city's control. How can future biologists help in designing better cities. They can help primarily by becoming real biologists, schoolers, scores of life, experts of life processes, masters of complexity and autonomy, and champions of a way of thinking that grasps the wholeness of phenomena without reducing them to simple and delusional mechanisms. Biosemiotics is a key discipline for understanding the landscape and its functional relations to the humans who inhabit it. Ecology, come from Greek, Greek oikos means house, is the science of housing and it is about belonging. The study of bioclimatic variables is needed to design affordable and pleasant places that rely on the best use of natural conditions and energy, like sun, light, wind, microorganisms. Biomimicry 
is an increasing relevant technical application of biology in building engineering. Design, unfolding, and managing urban ecosystems require skills that are typical of life scientists. It is too serious of a matter to be left to urbanists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. And I have a question to you. You mentioned that the right city is not just uh, with a skyscraper and a tree on top of that. Can you tell me more in details? If I'm in the right city, <laughs> developed with the participation of biologists, when I understand it, that this is the right place, what are the signs? Just for me to understand that this is the new words in the city construction. Uh there is an example that is given by Marwa Zaboni. Marwa Zaboni is this great architect, a young architect who decided to stay and not leave Oms, the city of Syria has been bombed during the last war. And she explains very well how the classic traditional Syrian city, the Mediterranean city, was perfect for living until the 50s when uh, modernists started to change the city according to the model that was uh, winning in Europe. Like uh, French were building a new city with uh, literally with explosives. They, des they were destroying part of the ancient Middle Age cities to make avenue or allowing a flow of traffic to make the landscape uh, become made of uh, landmarks. So the big monuments, the big mosque, the big church should be visible for them. From everyone. The model before is very similar to the entire complex of Mediterranean urbanism that we have uh, in, the, in the basin of the Mediterranean and many other cities, also many traditional Russian cities are like that, where the poor and the rich live together, where there are trees that offer fruits to people for free, where there is free water, where there is free shower, where it's possible to socialize, where there is connection everywhere, where design itself offer a kind of a connection to different scales of the city. When you have a city where the scale, for example, the architectural scale is disconnected, you got really a form of civic language that, that breaks connections among its inhabitants. When you have a zoning, means that the workers are on this part of the city, the rich are in the other part, the Christians are there, the Muslims are there, so they don't connect to each other, they don't participate in the common building of the language of the city, then you got a loss. You got something that uh, start creating tension and eventually the basis for war. The uh, famous book is um, called The Battle for Home. It's exactly about that. She explains how the conflict in Syria started for, of course, interest of big powers, etc. But the basis was made already, has been already built by those who live there because the city has been transforming into a machine for producing economy and not anymore for producing civic society. So you can tell that when you lack beauty, when you lack uh, connection, when you lack the possibility of uh, interacting among different social classes or different religions or different cultures, when there is not this common, let's say, pot where everybody can participate in cooking, the common destiny of the city. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. You know, I'm not sure whether my microphone works well, but when, you know, our colleague Stefano mentions his view, he mentioned a wide range of directions of people who live in the same world and they cannot understand each other because they belong to different disciplines. They only, you know, knock on different doors, but they cannot see each other. For our future lectures, for our future events, I would like for us to highlight the main direction which allows us to find this connection between the um, semiotics, between ecological 
systems. I believe that it should be called like biosemiotics. You mentioned that, you know, this science, which erased in 27, in 1917, 1918, due to a very genius researcher we had by the way an association of biosemiotics and it gave life to a very important direction environmental psychology it is called the center of biosemiotics the capital is the city of Tallinn and they follow the steps of human beings they say that every biological species they have their own life cycle lifestyle but it goes with the worldview and biosemiotics can show us what is the role of the city from the point of view of biology for our personal growth for our opportunity to live together to live united and this opportunity to touch upon these connections i believe that this is a very important thing from the point of view of biosemiotics there are different world views like bio senses biological senses the space for biological sp spaces another world for example as a field of notions and meanings like noosphere and the world has a system of personal senses what um, does the city mean for me you mentioned the question of beauty why do i love this city well it's not enough again there are some reasons egocentric reasons but does the city love me and what kind of synergy we have together and I think that if our colleagues will comment to them, Natalia, Irina, I'm sure that they have their own experience, points of views. We can have a look at the city from the points of view of design, anthropological design, and it's extremely interesting. We can have a look at it just as Irina does. And they have interactive lessons, games in order to understand some phenomena. If I understand that correctly from the presentation, they have a wonderful museum. And all together from our university, from the Moscow State University, we are united with the cities. We live in the same cities. However, they represent different cities. Well, now let's have a look together. Are they fortresses which are isolated? So my colleagues, the floor is yours. Okay. If we were started talking about semantic and semiotics, this is the way for me to get an opportunity to use these technical words in order to unfold our conversation of tonight and to highlight the topical questions about the biophilosophy of the city. So tonight we will try to discuss together some processes and the foundations which are connected to the place, to the environment where we live. And I need to admit that I'm very glad to be here. Thank you once again for the invitation. I think that in general philosophy is the most important science. It includes very many disciplines, which is an integral part of this science. It's the most important part of the architecture, which is involved in the searching of different senses and meanings. And the foundation of the architecture is the question which is trying to be solved by philosophy for thousand years. This is the question of balance, balance and integrity in the city of natural and artificial pieces or components components this is quite a paradoxical situation in which a human being can combine those things that cannot go along and it should represent an integral system so 
it might seem to us that we cannot solve those questions and tasks because we have an impression that indeed there are some constructive engineering transport industrial all those that part of the city they cannot be like living processes and mechanism they cannot be combined and live in a harmony with the environment with living species and this is a nice object for research However, the very first research was conducted in the first century before Christ. Every single step and period of different events when the cities might be destroyed, the economics might fall down, the society might have an act of request to do some modernization of the cities. But for very many centuries, there were no new disruptions in this field, just because in the foundation of the architecture as the science, as the science of art, there are fundamental laws which make the city to be an integral, to have an integrity not to be just you know when everything is connected closely it is a stable environment and this term is used highlighting the development of the city so the initial task of the architecture which it was formulated by ancient people is to create something to create a vivid organism which would be capable to have the characteristics and features of a living system. And one of the forms and technologies which get together everything which is living and not living, the same author who describes in his book, he dedicated a book about the architecture, not only with the help of the complex approach, which uh, includes climatic, geodesical, geographical perimeters in order to create a city, an environment. In his book, it's a wonderful book, by the way, very limited number of letters, so it makes the book really engaging for a reader. So he provides very bright examples to research, to discover this place and to find the right location for the city in which, for example, women can sing beautifully. And when you face, I don't know, as a young man, a young girl, when you touch upon that quickly, it might seem to you, well, it's beautifully sad, it's a metaphor. However, maybe it was in the year of 15 and 17, anyway, recently, in one of the biological journal, a research was published which confirmed the dependency of the voice, of the power of the voice of the human being, which depends on the climate and the humidity of the air. And all those recommendations from the ancient times they were developed and this idea of the egalitarianism between all species living in the world on earth it was postulated by alberti alberti was the person who found the inspiration in nature and he gave this beginning in comparison and on the contrast to modern environmental specialists who tried to conduct egocentrism. Alberti was considering in dynamics. Alberti gave a person, a human being, a chance to develop his or her opportunities, capabilities, to find this balance, to create this balanced system on Earth. Right now, we can often hear different other terms, for example, anthropo. Well, something, you know, when in the 16th century, what urbanism, yes, maybe, uh, maybe this term, I don't remember properly, the spirit of time, 
we live right now in an Anthropocene epoch. And since that time, they started to blame human beings, blame people that people do not deserve compassion. Alberti has this compassion and uh, Plato, he considered a city as a dynamic living system because he, species are developing, the whole system is evolving and a human being during their life, they're getting wiser. I think that sometimes we might get wiser as well this time. And yes, I can talk a lot about different aspects, but I would like to comment on the following thing that in the 20s, years or at the end of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, the Russian architecture school, it was connected to natural sciences. Physiologists like Sechin, he mentioned that it's impossible to research an organism without searching and researching the environment it is placed and all this industrialization, all those things that our dearest Italian colleague mentioned. In that particular moment, when a house became a machine, a car, all those humanistic approaches, they, are disappear they had disappeared. Philosophy, architecture, everything has disappeared. It was closed in laboratory rooms in order to be able to research different types of reactions, biologists changed the environment and then they analyzed the reaction of the bodies. Being an architect myself, I, of course, research all those papers, biological papers, and compare the reactions of different species, I can draw a conclusion about different qualities of cities. And this balance system, which is interacting, this allows us to create a carcass, a body, and by the way, it was mentioned for the first time at the end of the 19th century. All those bodies that we are discussing right now like to have them as the system in its foundation according to its principal values and the composition. It was written in the concept of Howard um, City Garden, and this concept is evolving in new modern conditions and industrialization and other conditions, so on and so forth. So many brilliant papers, names you mentioned, Plat Plato, Virgilius, it looks like they are in our club. Well, they might ask themselves, what were we doing? They were, we were, discovering city, biology of the city, and this is just another perspective. And uh, you highlighted this once again, we need to go beyond the borders. Yes, so is the city, as you underlined, how to make a city more uh, rich in an adaptive for a human being? What are your observations in your papers? How do you see the world itself? Hello, dear colleagues, once again, to begin with, I would like to cover several terms, biologists and ecologists, they're two different professions. I would like to ask our people, our guests here, could you please raise your hands? Um, is the biologist is not ecologist. Okay, wonderful. What is the difference between a biologist? Biologist is a specialist who studies life, life processes, different connections between different bodies. Ecologists, the specialists who um, 
studies even more because ecology, this is the science between the connection and the relation of different organisms and species and their relationship with the environment. That is why ecology it is uh, quite a different science, which also includes biology. And when we speak about city, it is an artificial environment for human beings. Unfortunately, very often, there is not enough space in this nature. And this is the case when we face different challenges. First of all, they are the problems connected to the influence of the human activity, not only on the nature and the environment, as well on our health, on our bodies. So they are the processes which goes in parallel. If we talk about cities, they are sustainability. I can see that, that a city is balanced and it should be balanced in what a way? It shouldn't be tall or it should be divided into zones. Because if we will read different papers of different authors of different years and we'll pay attention to the science as video ecology, this is, is being developed right now, we can see that houses should look like not, you know, like um, those uh, who place different numbers of people, the heights of building should be equal to the heights of trees grown around. When we spend lots of time in those cities, in those houses, um, we might suffer from stress, our vision can decrease, the quality of vision can decrease, and also we should uh, remember about so the contamination of the cities, the traffic, cars, they can influence negatively on our health, on nature around us, and so the city Again, is evolving a developing system. It's very difficult to develop the city and to protect and to preserve the nature. The protection of nature equals to our health. The more trees, the more green zones we have in the city, the higher the quality of our life is. We will have a look at the World Health Organization statistics. There are four main parameters which can evaluate our health, the quality of the environment, the medical indicators or medical institutions, genetics, and the fourth one is the lifestyle. The lifestyle and ecological environmental part will unite them they give us 70 percent in general so that is why our lifestyle our place of living and the environment of it our quality of life depends on all these factors and of course everyone wants to have a long life a happy life yes the city means a higher quality of life however it means other risks additional risks and those risks are different they're connected to contamination contamination of air of ground of earth of water we face contamination of air very often in big cities and if this topic seems too attractive and interesting there are so many publications on this topic of different authors they will tell us how to get to know, how to learn, which is, uh, what is the safety of the city for us? What are the demographical and statistical parameters? There are different reports regarding the state of the city's state of health. For example, bronchitis, anginas from patients, from children. There are different um, respiratory diseases, they are the indicators of the situation in a city or in a country in general. We'll have a look at the monitoring of different analysis, different minimal micro particles. It is another parameter which should be considered in order to understand what is the sustainability of the city. There are small particles, again, a very minimal one. They can indicate that the diesel 
is used in cars, and all those particles in diesel can provoke oncological diseases. Again, statistics in Moscow, a high rates of oncological diseases and heart diseases, they are on the first position. How it should be corrected? Well, right now there are electronic buses they can reduce the contamination of the city to increase the quality of life. However, we shouldn't forget that maybe the most difficult thing is to provide the city with green zones. Unfortunately, they are um, space their superfice is being reduced. And very often when we go for a walk somewhere to different zones, we are consumers of this nature. We do not think what time is required for this tree to grow. We can have a walk in the forest. Very often we are that factor, that factor that reduces the quality of our life. Maybe my um, speech was not connected. You know, I went to different directions, but I tried to combine different disciplines in my presentation, epidemiology, industrialization, medicine, and even a little bit talk about video ecology. Irina. You know, Rina, you named very precise things, very precious ones. And there is a small intrigue, a positive intrigue. Just as you began, you talked to our orders directly. You followed that logic, the, the Tower of Babel. You know, environment ecology has its own borders. Biology has its own borders. Archaeology has another borders. But indeed, you know, when, you know, it's a kind of a provocation, a right provocation. I look at you attentively. I saw lots of people who raise their hands they express their empathy. Yes, they confirm that ecology is right, is broader than biology. I don't know, maybe biology is true, it's more a narrow discipline. I would like to ask you a provocative question. Life sciences, biology. Well, it's not a coincidence that our new faculty of life sciences in our institution it's true that it's very complex question. Irina, you remember how many ecological faculty we have in Moscow State University in geographical faculty and other faculties, and they say, no, our ecology is correct one. I mean, social ecology, economical ecology, they all different. Some other scientists might say, well, ecology has another definition. Ecology, this is the thing, the object, what I'm doing. So I mean that there are so many discussions and you highlighted, you highlighted that. It was a kind of a first question. And you also mentioned a very important thing, city biology authority. Our dear colleague Stefan also mentioned the same thing the connection between city and power. You remember this was a beautiful phrase, good people, people from Moscow, good people. However, they are spoiled by housing question. Who said that for the first time? Do you remember Volant from the Master and Margaret written by Mikhail Bulgakov? And uh, how to build this city? which won't spoil and ruin its citizens, its inhabitants. You know, you remember five-story buildings. Maybe some of you lived and that in those times, it was 1960s. It was a total depersonalization, de-individualization, just to kill any type of individuality. Our Italian colleagues, environmental psychologists, they demonstrated in their studies that every totalitarian system has different approaches to city building processes. They build cities and houses differently. They 
submit um, they subdue the personality of people and in other systems well it can look differently if uh, the city won't spoil the personality may, may i advocate the devil and ask the next question um, maximum individuality might be achieved in rural areas. Just you can build a house according to your project. Maybe we shouldn't attract nature to cities. Maybe we do not need green areas to cities. I'm not very deep into this topic. Maybe in the furthest future, maybe we should leave cities not trying to create something artificially what we cannot create here in cities do you see such a development and perspective or the city creates for us some aspects which are important positively and which is what we need but will bring nature to the cities what's your vision it's a wonderful uh, it's wonderful you're being advocates of devil you know the devil is next to us it's wonderful. So all those questions are very acute ones and asked by Olga as well. They are very important questions. What is the movement downshifting? When people leave cities, they leave, they go away from cities. This is a social movement which can be observed nowadays. You know, it's a human process. People escape cities. However, in your question, there is a very good moment um, when the city, when the forest will reach the borders of the city. There are so many fantastic stories in which a forest had a war with cities. It's, uh, you know, when um, a city was described as a fortress, and the forest wants it to bomb, to explode, to make the city explode, to take its place. You know, everything is happening. Neither Olga, neither me, we know we, we wouldn't like to be, you know, like a dentist trying to um, remove a teeth. So, Professor, what's your vision? You look at us with such a philosophic view, like Socrates, and would like to listen to your opinion. I just finished um, publishing a paper, I mean, finalizing a paper with two colleagues. Uh, they are one, one is an ecologist, the other one is a biologist. Exactly about the relation between rurality and the urban environment. The issue, when you say about the forest to come to attack the city in a way, um, we, we have the wilderness, we have the rurality, and we have this, the urban the city. The problem is that we disconnected these elements from each other. And now in Italy, we have this tradition of the ancient Middle Age city, let's say. Uh, the city has a natural connection with the, the, the landscape, the natural landscape. An example is given by the famous frescoes in Siena, in the city of Siena, in the city hall of Siena, there is this beautiful fresco uh, that's called the good government and the bad government. The good government shows a beautiful city where everybody is productive, they are friends, they live together, they enjoy life. And around it, there is a beautiful countryside. So the countryside is producing food, there is order, there is light, etc. And then the bad government, the bad government, whose real name was the individual interest. The real name was not bad government, was the individual interest against the common interest. When you have an individual interest take over the common interest, the first thing you see that is uh, totally broken is the countryside. The countryside becomes an evil environment, a landscape that is horrible, where people get killed, where there is violence, there is not a production of agriculture, it's just wilderness. And the same wilderness is represented inside the city. The city falls apart, uh, injustice, it happens everywhere, there is violence, and there is the power of demons that uh, are represented with big horns and horrible faces, and are the, the, the people who dominate the city for their own sake, for their own interest. So the two things come together. There is a kind of harmony, a kind of uh, order, that also as a, as a matter of uh, scale. You cannot have a, a megalopolis with uh, 12 millions of inhabitants 
without a connection to the countryside, because then that city becomes weak. It needs to import food, energy. It needs to import everything from outside. And how it does it? It does it by violence. The, the city, the model of the Middle Ages city is very interesting because it works very well. The city is autonomous because it can collect itself from the, its own countryside. It can collect the food, it can collect energy, it can collect the materials. And this helps producing several good effects. One of them, for example, it's typical that a person who lives in a little town, I live in a little town, for example, in Italy, uh, near Rome, it's on the top of a hill, it's a middle-aged town, and there is a connection with the environment around. People here don't pollute the land that provide food for them. There is also a different approach to the environment because you are interested in that. This is the, the soil that produces the bread for your child. You want soil it, you, you want, uh, you want to put poison in it. But if you live in a big, huge city, you even don't know where the bread comes from. Uh, children from big cities think that milk comes from a, an industry, not from cows. You don't care. You don't care about uh, the, your environment because it's not your environment anymore. So you don't belong anymore to your place. The contemporary uh, huge cities nowadays, except a few exceptions, are known places. So are just the uh, hubs of flows of economy, energy, workforce, consumption, etc. But they are not places where you can belong. And belonging means, we go back to this idea of uh, biosemiotics, it's a matter of connecting to the other for having a common project. And the others is not only the other people, it's also the space, it's also the animals, it's also the vegetation, etc. And I will make a little remark about uh, two concepts of cities, as been told to me by Professor Sergio Loss. The Greek city, the model of Plato, is a city that is based on the concept of genos, of blood. So we, we are the citizens of the same city because we share somehow a kind of uh, origin. We are, come from the same ancestors. Then there is the Roman model of city. The Roman model is a city that accepts everybody. You can have a different color of the skin, you can be a different religion, etc. But you share with me the same project. That's a different concept of city. It's a city that is moving towards something. And has, of course, a meaning that is political in a, in a deep, different sense than uh, used to be in the Greek, in the Greek world. I believe that it's a very important question, how the city can give a birth to identity. Right now, I believe that our speakers might tell us in Rome, people have or citizens have one identity. When we live in another Italian city or um, the island of Ischia, they have another identity. Um, it differs from Roman one from the point of view on environment, ecology, and etc. So the question of city, symbios, this is the question that should be addressed. We are talking a lot about the changes in the Darwin evolution via conflict. There is a symbiotic evolution, the symbios of a human being, which differs from the previous one. Maybe this is the symbiotic evolution. And this is the question and that we addressing in these days. And maybe another matter for that comes to my mind about two different people, one from Vladimir Vladimirovich, I mean, um, the poet Mayakovsky. Um, city is a garden. It's a beautiful idea of um, academician Dmitry Likachov. A city as a such may be regarded as the harmony, harmony in which a citizen lives in the city. We speak all together. However, we also have guests. Maybe our guests might comment or might add something to our discussion. Do you have some questions to your audience? Or we are quite successful because we are talking about life sciences maybe you got confused and you just can't understand 
anything from our conversation because this is the reaction of your brain on new material. Yes, we have some questions from our foreign guests. We have our English translation. Maybe this is the right time. So I'd like to repeat this question. I hope that our guests and speakers might answer this question. Okay, so the question is, in your opinion, can we combine clever cities, smart cities, which are being implemented in developing developed countries with the idea of bio-urbanism. Is bio-urbanism the last uh, civic form of um, city resistance, urban resistance? How can you comment such a question? What are your ideas? Well, thank you for the question. So, who, no, the question is to Stefan, maybe, and then other guests. Can you comment on this question? Thank you. Okay. So I, I used to say something, I published something about uh, smart cities. And my opinion is that uh, I have a slogan, the smart cities for dumb citizens. So we have to be also a little bit malignant sometimes about what is proposed to us as a you know, the cutting edge evolution of the city. The smart cities is exactly that the evolution of that form of city I was criticizing at the beginning, a kind of a machine. So it's a form of um, um, evolving into a new form of capitalism, the, capitalism, the extractionist capitalism of um, control that we, we live now in. And the city becomes a tool for uh, going ahead with this extraction of data and information from, from us. Now, nowadays, we are producing uh, data and that's the, the, the new frontier of capitalism in a way. Um, the idea that the smart city can be an evolution, uh, yes, it depends what kind of evolution, where are you going towards? So we have a world built a new urban century everybody is excited about that but this urban center is a, a military system of control is a extractionist system of uh, capitalists that create injustices and i think that's not the right direction it's in, in fact in my opinion the opposite of what my urban it should be we need cities where there is no interfaces where we need cities where people can directly interact with each other and with the environment that does not, this big distance, these big interfaces can be a big physical distance or a distance in information and in control of this information in order to have freedom for ourselves. And freedom means also the, the freedom of living as we are, evolving toward a more human form of city. Um, so I don't know if by urbanism is the, is the end of this process. Of course, I don't think it is but uh, he wants to be uh, a contribution to make a city that is more responsible where citizens are part of it really belonging to it and then contribute to, to a better future for everybody thank you natalia would you please remind us the question yes just a moment i i forgot the question okay your opinion, can we combine technologically smart city, which are implementing, being implemented in developed countries? It is the last form of, of city resistance. Well, I do not understand what kind of resistance you mean and what is this form, this militaristic question, because, you know, well, communists, Mm, how to say this? The mastership of organization of cities initially it is a symbiosis of sciences of arts and initially the question is about the balance between artificial and natural environment that is why well I cannot see any resistance or any processes like that, I see only that the approach is changing. The approach for design is 
changing. So these acts of creating all those pieces, housing, the tools, now I use difference in order to create and again, getting back, step back from the last resistance, last battle for harvest, I don't know, for what, for something. Alexander mentioned totalitarian cultures. Yes, we can see that the history of human beings is repetitive. And it looks like that we have covered some issues. Yeah, some time ago, we had an idea that, well, people have solved all the questions. And right now we are trying to resolve the issues of environment. Then we find out that on the new level, all those questions, we have to address them again and again. And people repeat the same stories, the same situation, and we'll observe the history of human beings, of uh, the building of cities, all the totalitarian regimes, they can be described by proportions. Because, you know, in all totalitarian cities, it is mandatory to suppress a human being, and it is done via approaches of Jigen times, and if they were Mexican tribes or Egyptian folks, or we will compare these buildings with the building of Moscow State University, we might observe different historical stages when a person had their identity and people created according to their worldview, how they saw worldview. And uh, getting back to Moscow State University building, when I was young, I was clever enough, or maybe bold, during the discussion of my thesis, uh, I was pretty ashamed because I was very bold. And getting back to the model of those cities in which the nature, art, they find that balance. Why do they need that actually? Because a human being as a vivid living body and first, raw materials, resources are very important for a human being and to survive. That is why this model, city garden, this model by Howard, it is a social, economical, and uh, it created this rhythm, these proportions, which creates this balance. And finally enough, you know, the city on the planet of Mars, which is being built by Elon Musk, you know, it's new name. This, she's a Chinese goddess responsible for harmony. Harmony, again, this ancient term describe how we can combine different parts together, different pieces together. So harmony is an integrative science or integrative thing. When we say that the beauty will save and rescue the world, this is about the harmony. Well, and uh, what else? I'm getting confused. Ah, oh, we are getting back to Elon Musk. Yes, uh, on Earth, we create different models of cities and we use them in order to develop bigger processes. And Elon Musk, his story was, you know, turned down 
and to have a look at the world with the eyes turned down because he uses the same geometric schemes and he tries to apply them on Mars and he organizes different colonies on other planets and the city again it is called new she is the goddess responsible for harmony and plato he also mentioned very similar aspects and each of the five cities which elon musk is now creating they are semantically and semiotically connected with the first element. So that is why, with my greatest pleasure, I'm observing these processes when we get an impression that we're trying to create something totally new. However, later on, we discover that it's, it's not new. Everything was done before. Maybe it's a kind of a professional deformation. However, for me, all the recent latest questions also regarding for example artificial intelligence maybe can it include spirits power some art some creativity the understanding of beauty to give it as the feeling as of beauty as the reaction to the environment that is why i always have such an impression impression that all the questions should be regarded and all the answers should be found in the history and just to observe its transformation with time irina thank you very much pardon me you know i think that we should remember when we try to create something new, it can be both a good thing and a bad thing. But how can we use these new things? If we will have a look at a typical city or a typical region in Moscow, just zone in Moscow, I see only regress. I'm not talking about design itself. I mean about, I mean, appearance. Appearance is very important for us as well but this direction is clear because it is much more easier to build to construct a city or a district in such a way it's just business but i think it's a kind of a deadlock you know and uh, this is how it looks like nowadays there are different reasons economical economic political reasons but maybe our world should be changed. We don't have any other option. And by urbanism, this is the phen phenomena, phenomenon which will be developing in the future. It should be developing in the future. Technically, it requires assistance because vertical green areas, um, green rooftops, we might find them in foreign countries. This is a great step to the direction of sustainable development. Goal number 11, sustainable city. It is all connected to the climate change issues. We face those issues every year. And this is a very topical question that is why by urbanism, you know, it is a systematic approach how does a city should develop city is a garden we said we said that so many times you know moscow initially in its concept in 1960 it was stated that moscow should be a green city and in 1960 moscow was a um, city which had the first position in its ranking among the cities in terms of vegetation. However, it's not true for 2023. So we have to deal with this issue and to invest our funds in this direction. So you're answering a question, the question of Olga. No, this is not my question. This is the question from the chat. Oh, pardon me. Okay, so we should follow this track this track of bio-urbanism and of course if there are some innovational ideas in order how to 
improve the color, the forms, and all that. They also influence our stability, our psyche, and this collaboration between business, politicians, ecologists, biologists, all together, they can solve this issue. That is, the city is still growing, and it's clear why the quality of life is higher. There are so many options, so many well-beings. However, at the same time in the cities, the risks of different psycho diseases, they are higher. Again, we are getting back to color, to forms, to massive areas of people. So this is my answer again. This is all about interdisciplinarity and responsibility and responsibility of every single person in a good way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I have very many questions from the chat of general nature. May I also command this question again, because it's a kind of an, a strong opposition smart city and bio-urbanism. It looks like, you know, whether bio-urbanism might create a manifestation, organized manifestation for a smart city. Why so? Because all the time we are trying to escape from different phobias, from different fears. We are afraid, so very scared of artificial intelligence. We are so scared. We have just freaked out who will win, who will overcome artificial intelligence or us who is stronger but this is a nation question we were afraid of everything from the very beginning of our history we had big fears when we created first um, robots we were afraid of everything we had so many friends but at the same time we have so many um fears different characters from books and movies we are so scared and that is why i can see so many scare in this question again poet russian poet Vintensky, he described in his words and his lines how um, a robot at knife at night came to my house and asked for my wife robot just give me your wife you know it's historically, you remember 1960s, people were scared robots. No, not true. My situation is when I mentioned that bio-urbanism is not an opposition to smart cities. Absolutely, you are quite right. This is about search, this is about harmony. It's not an opposition. It's not like, you know, other green activists which are going to attack everyone in order to preserve the nature. When we say bionics, what does it mean? Does it mean that we would like to learn something from nature to create minerals? Yes, it's true. When we talk about bioherbanism, again, we repeat the same clever and wise way we want to learn the best things from evolution. We want to say what we need in order to provide us with the biotechnological balance. And uh, I can see one hand from the audience. Yes, but before I'd like to add a small example about what is a smart city and not quite a smart city. When we walk down the street and we can see those strange uh, trees and artificial lights, it's not about smart city. It costs over 1 million rubles. Well, it might be an element of design of an exterior. However, when you see so many artificial trees and they try to cover some space and uh, the um, authorities might say, it's a, well, it's a strange city because they do not perform their functions. The function of a tree is not only to represent beauty, it's not only about microclimate, it's not only about anti-contamination uh, function, it is also an ecosystem for small organisms, for insects. And when you interchange the terms, we need to understand that. We need to understand what a clever city or smart city means and not smart city means. 
Uh, this morning, I've attended a training for disabled people uh, and how to communicate with them. I learned so many useful information during this training. You know, in the subway, the underground, there are so many reasons, um, so many signs, signs for disabled people. And I found out that they are not so convenient for everyone, for people, for deaf people, for example, for blind people as well. But they didn't conduct any tests in any experiments, whether they are comfortable for disabled or not. And I think that in the development of the city, just ask the opinion of people or at least specialists. Very often we forget asking the opinion of professionals. It's not so comfortable to trust them. Sorry, but this is our truth. No, indeed, we are here just to talk about the truth. Okay, I can see so many questions from the audience, and one of them, I believe, is uh, uh, just uh, about what you are mentioning now. So, from the audience question, then from the chat. Dear colleagues, can you? First of all, introduce yourself and to use the microphone just to create an ecologically equal situation. Can you introduce yourself? Yes, it works. Does it work? We hope so. It suits you well. Uh, hello, once again, my name is Ivan Kluyev. I'm a student, first year student. And uh, I have a very interesting example from modern times. I know that, you know, Singapore City actively it tries to implement bio, bio urbanism in, uh, in its life. And I know they are actively, they are trying not to preserve green areas. They are trying all these construction city uh, buildings at some vegetation in advance to see uh, the combination, the humidity, the airflow. I remember Olga at the very beginning said, or made a joke, yes, a tree on the rooftop is not enough. However, the problem of big cities is that buildings, office buildings, they take lots of space and they didn't give any, they don't give any chance for parks, for green areas. So the solution might be to make the buildings green. Maybe it's something unbelievable. However, Singapore, it's a very good example. And private houses is also another example. They are covered in trees or in some plants, you know, some tropical plants or something like that. And the whole building, the whole house performs this function to stop the action, the activities of human beings. And I believe that this might be a solution from our modern problems. So what do you think about that? It's very interesting to listen to your opinion. Pardon me, may I intervene? I would like to intervene and comment on that. When we talk about this direction, we should remember that Singapore and Moscow, they are two different cities and plants, it's a living creature. They can also destroy this building because they can be like a substrate, you know, uh, stone, some other things. So that is why it requires certain skills and expertise. What uh, kinds of species of plants can be used there? For example, in Moscow, we have very cold winters. Very interesting project right now is being tested. They use mosses for external parts of the buildings. But when we mean a center, the center of the city is very harmonic. Yes, there are some non-organic elements uh, built in 1990s or 2000s, which do not go with other buildings. 
And in parks, there are other problems. We have people responsible for green areas. They are not gardeners. They are not biologists. If you will compare Moscow and St. Petersburg, again, you will see the difference because there are specialists, there are professionals, there are non-professionals, amateurs, and different ministries. Again, it is a problem. What are the agreements between different ministries? Because there are different departments and it's a very complex project. It's, it might be easy and complex at the same time, time. I have another comment about this aspect. I've heard that it's not convenient that all those buildings, they are in all those plants because there are so many insects and maybe this aspect was not thought uh, thoroughly at the very beginning, or maybe it's not true. May I? May I again? I would like to intervene and comment there are other interesting projects about insects. We know that they will be present there. It's a very important aspect. And uh, they are very important for cities, for biodiversity of the cities, like bees, other insects, and there are some genetical aspects, including pesticides. How to solve those issues? If we talk about insects, we need to build some, to construct some buildings in Holland, in the Netherlands, they try to bus stops, to decorate bus stops, to make them attractive for bees. Um, for birds, we need to organize some space on roof, some specific to some specific materials, some blocks with, uh, you know, with the interior zones for birds to create nests. We can solve this question, but we need to think about these aspects and advice. In advance, we have uh, in Moscow nightingales. Nightingales, it's like, you know, the highest bird. It means that the society is adequate and is stable. There are different types of birds and they have different level of sustainability for ecosystems. What uh, stability is? The more, um, the highest species we have, the more stable our world is. It means that the rooftops of the Moscow State University is very uh, convenient for different types of birds. Okay, may I uh, move on? I would like to say that all that that you are saying is very important and very beautiful, but when there are so many species, different species, it allows to create a stable system and this principle of biodiversity, yes, biodiversity as soon as we unify unify the system the system is changing our colleagues from singapore it's a marvelous approach and uh, we need to analyze it singapore is a country which has um, the highest level of higher education, the level of corruption is very small. It has a unique level. Singapore and some other countries, they are preparing to organize, uh, to create some ministry of happiness. In this situation, we need to understand how trees, grass, not only biological species, they are creatures, they are living creatures, they are systems. And how can we have a common language? Singapore tries to find the answers on this question, but if you want this perspective or symbiosis of different species, maybe I'm not quite um, intelligent right now with the terms and the definitions, however, I'm very thankful for this question because it's very important. Singapore way in biourbanism is very important as well as I believe that you mentioned Han Shui, Chinese um, culture, each culture tries to adapt to the environment 
Chinese culture has one values, Russian culture has another values, and we should regard also all those questions and issues when we discuss different questions for interaction. I remember the words of my teacher, you shouldn't ask a cat to perform dog's function. The same in this situation, we should learn the tasks and functions from different species. Now, you know, the most scary thing is like smart cities. There are so many books when plants are starting to attack cities. Hitchcock, you remember Hitchcock movies? There were birds, birds who tried horror movie, birds tried to destroy all the human population. This, I believe that we have so many competition between human beings, we shouldn't compete with the nature. It's a very important question. And also I would like to add in Singapore system, I like their attitude to waste, to refute. They have a very strict system of fines, you know, for chewing gums, for cigarettes, for smoking. I believe it's fear, you know, sometimes, you know, in some aspects, it might be critical, exaggerated. However, it forces the society to get accustomed to basic things, to, um, think about the waste, to sort out waste, you know, they can build even some additional spaces from this waste. They can build islands and on those islands, they try to develop the city to build new housing. That is why this is their task to think about waste carefully like plastic metal glass it's yes you are quite right quite precise you know it can be connected to the question from the chat box and uh, yes we are now uh, answering the question from the chat what are the examples of the countries or the cities who are, which are more harmonious one you know, I noticed that I'm listening to the discussion attentively. Oh, my, my glasses. And I have an impression that we are discussing those issues of bio-urbanism, of philosophy, of architecture in such a way that there is only one solution and only that solution is correct one. But in truth, Ivan also mentioned that the planet Earth is a very diverse one. There are biological, geological, climate conditions, and in city futurism, the solutions of the vertical solutions are appropriate one the city can grow up. They try to invent some compensational mechanism to create general system between skyscrapers one that can create or add some objects on the rooftops to create some parks on rooftops to create some plain zones, plain areas. In architecture, they develop new approaches to create flexible functions. Today, for example, I need a children, kids playground here. Tomorrow I can organize a class event and vertical urbanism can solve those questions. How can we create? And also there is a French architect, I don't remember his surname, but in one cooperation, French created a vertical city it's not only that it's vertical one, but there are some special plants which people can eat those plants. You can go on your balcony, for example, to collect or harvest, to get your breakfast, supper, lunch. 
with big squares, big places, with some space, which allows to develop horizontal architecture, just as we like, like with the garden, the small house, which can equal to a human size and can create for those people natural environments. Again, getting back to Ivan, there is an interesting direction which he mentions the creation of the third landscape. Again, there are different thoughts, different researches on this topic and practical competitions, architectural one. When artificial buildings, they are combined and they can represent different landscapes. And in such a direction, in such movement, there is a dependency between life, between dynamics of life, everything which is developing and that is why again what is about the cities about uh, the urbanism we cannot just fix only one thing and to set some borders everything depends on time on place on the concept on time on people who are there and this model of where different gardens, different small story buildings, artificial space, and everything is connecting in symbiosis with such a location in architecture. It's wonderfully people can form self-management, values, priorities. They have humanistic inclinations and activities so indeed those cities provoke people to get together to get connected they can combine artificial natural environments and all those conditions between people they start um, appearing in those connections or glue, I would rather say, and everyone is involved in the system. Stefano, by the way, mentioned it beautifully when he mentioned some Mediterranean cities. Okay, let us cover other questions about uh, some precise live cities, some precise questions to speakers, and I can seize this opportunity because I have this question. I would choose the questions which I found attractive for our countries, very topical one. I think that it is connected to the city of Moscow. How will we solve the issues with uh, um, hedges, Stefana, or fences? Maybe uh, Stefano might address this question. There are different fences in cages, not only in Moscow, but also in other countries. It's quite a serious question, a fence. Should we change the mentality of a person, the world's perception, in order to make it a friendly one? Fence in psychology is the key question. Maybe fences for every discipline is a key question. Well, Stefana, maybe. can you share your opinion with us? Yeah, and I would like to reconnect to the previous discussion about both smart cities and uh, let's say by urban cities, and like the example of Singapore. And I have a caveat. The caveat is uh, don't trust too much architects, don't trust too much philosophers. That's, yeah, I, I, I call for biologists. Um, I had a discussion many years ago when they were designing this kind of icon in Milan, in Italy, so-called Bosco Verticale, the vertical woods. It's this famous, iconic, tall building with plants everywhere. And this, this has become a kind of hype and a model for many cities around the world, especially in China. And the discussion was about uh, how this is really uh, something that can work. And the, the project, managers of the organization told me, oh yes, the plants will survive there because we, we provide them with a special soil and there is a special care for this plant. And also we selected some special plants 
in order for them to stay at uh, you know, 50 meters high and survive. And in the same time, in, in Milan, there was a public park as was as being closed because there was no public body for maintaining it. So the point is, if I'm rich, I can live on the fifth floors and have my plants, special plants, cost a lot of money, a lot of water, but it's totally unsustainable. It's a model that brings injustice. It's unsustainable because you consume a lot of energy and waste a lot of water for nothing, just for an aesthetic point of view. And it's not true that uh, dead plants can give fruit for my breakfast when I live on the fifth floor, because well, usually I go, if I live on that building, I'm very rich, I go in luxurious restaurants every day. So when we talk about um, smart cities, smart cities is not just the technology applied to make us safe, energy, etc. Architects don't design cities. Engineers don't design cities. Cities are designed by economic dynamics. And these economic dynamics include the big interests. Now these interests are global. So they are very far away from the city that they design. They represent power that was far away from us. My point about the little towns, the little cities is because there there is, can be a space of independency of people. It's a, it's, a, it's a people scale. You can have trees that gives fruit for free on the street where you pass by, where the poor pass by, where I pass by, where everybody pass by. But if you have it on the fifth floor of a building for rich people, the gated community, uh, this is not the same thing. So it's very important to, to, to think where this goes. When we ask the same question, what kind of city is really harmonious as an example, etc., you have to pay attention not to uh, fall for advertising in a way, because uh, there are specialist uh, companies specialized in making you see beautiful things that are also beautiful. One example is Neom, the big, huge cities, long kilometers that uh, will be built in the desert in Arabia, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that city is a kind of um, dystopia. It is, it's considered like an example of a beautiful technology, a beautiful, uh, um, environmentally friendly city, it's not. The, the imagine building a thing like that in the desert, how you provide the water, how much it costs in terms of technology, um, energy, etc. So, and what I learned in these 20 past years is that uh, there is a lot of what we see that is totally fake, it's, it's, it's sold to us. And beyond that, there is an agenda. The agenda of the smart city, for example, is the same of what is called the extractive capitalism. So societies now provide why you can use Google for free, why you can use Facebook for free, because they need your data, this, this new gold mining. Same thing with the smart city. Smart city is meant to, to analyze and extract data. I know several scholars who do this job. They can tell you, by the way you walk through the city, your sexual orientation, your nationality, your age, et cetera. And they can extract this metadata and use that for economic purposes. So smart city is not so innocent. Um, when we talk about uh, what is a good example of a, of a bio urban city? Well, my friend Marco Casagrande, who is a Finnish architect, speak about ruins. He thinks that the best thing nowadays as a form of uh, resistance to something that's becoming inhuman as the development of, the, of, of, of our civilization, uh, inhuman means uh, something that goes against our biology, it goes against our feelings, it goes against our culture, it goes against our survival. It's the ruins of places that have been abandoned where nature become co architect with humans. And uh, he made a lot of works in tai Taipei, for example. He found these uh, abandoned towns where people live together with nature. He's a little bit an extremist. He make holes in the buildings that are abandoned in order for plants to grow up, etc. That's an example. I live myself in a kind of ruin. It's an ancient town that has been half abandoned, and it's beautiful. You can live in, in communion with the, with nature, with the community, the local community, because of the sites much more than the simple aspect of design. Design helps, of course, but it's not only that. Um, I think by urbanism is a perspective. It's not something that we have here and now. It's something like we have to build. Uh, I can found some by urban in, in Istanbul, in 
Moscow even, some microrayon have found a beautiful environment. I remember a discussion I had with some people about the horrible image of, of, of a microrayon, you know, with this uh, Khrushchev, this ancient building of the 60s, uh, with all these little windows, etc. They say, oh, this is horrible, this is uh, the design of uh, a terrible totalitarian system. But my experience is that in places like that, they found a lot of humankind, beautiful humanity, uh, education, culture, um, something that makes a community, even in a, in a place that may look not so nice, not so attractive, like, for example, Singapore. Maybe people are not so attentive to uh, take care of trash, but they can take care of human beings. They, they can see you as a human being. That's so relevant nowadays. It's so important. So I can feel and find little pieces of biourbanism everywhere in the world. Wherever I've been, I found something. The problem is this is mixed with all the stuff that is not so human. And, and I ask biologists to help in this. I think they can put a point of reference and say, this is good for your biology, for your life, and this is not. I'm afraid that we should choose only one question among all of that because we are lack of time. First of all, Olga, yes. Yes, let's try to answer some questions here. My name is Yuri Viktorich. I'm a physician. I would like to ask another question which was not asked previously. Here we are in a psychological university, we need to understand there are aspects which we understand and which and aspects which, which we are not understand, we, we cannot understand. Can you formulate your question briefly because we have very uh, limited time? Oh, well, it's very complicated because I need time to uncover my question well. Uh, Professor Smolov, from the very beginning, uh, told us that we need to shift the focus of our attention. There are some things that we can understand and some issues we cannot understand. Architectural, urbanistic aspect was considered here in a very detailed way. However, the life of a citizen, of an habitat, should be regarded as an ad energy. From conceptual point of view, energy we cannot avoid, we cannot live without energy. And energy is being transferred, being transmitted, translated, being irradiated. We use energy, but we do not understand it always. Let me show you, let me read you one passage from a book, just one paragraph. Upon we indeed have very what, what is the question what is the question yes I, I would like to raise a question among all those biological problems we shouldn't uh, be focused on figures itself we should also remember about about the impact on the bodies um, and uh, common um, a very few scholars can understand these questions and no interpreters can understand them as well. The problem or the issue which I'm trying to raise that we do not talk and hear about real problems. In order to talk about real problems, we need to talk with specialists, with professionals. Yeah, we had only one bi biologist among us. There are no other professionals. So that is why I invite you to invite real professionals. Irina, could you answer this question? Oh, well, um, indeed, it's a very complex and difficult problem. And if we will read different articles on this topic, it's very difficult to answer your question, because at the end, you have so many questions. Let us uh, have a look at the example of 5G. Some professionals might say, well, it's harmful. Some other specialists can say, no, 5G is 
it's quite fine but we have different uh, waves different frequencies we also have some irradiation we have different fields and correspondingly 5g might coincide with um, I don't know how to express myself correctly with the work, with the function of our inner bodies, because our heart has its beating, our brain has other frequencies, and our colleagues will help me. No, not yes, exactly. I quite right. And this question is very complicated. Maybe we should indeed organize another discussion with professionals to talk about the safety, safety of different types of contamination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? Uh, we don't have funny time because I would like to have some time for each speaker briefly to draw the line, to resume of the meeting. And also I'd like to listen to the necessity of biologists. We are creating a program Maybe you can comment on that. Do you need biologists? Are they, what do they represent for you? Bioecologists. Yes, uh, just say that you cannot live without them. Please, uh, Stefana, very briefly, just to draw the line of this meeting that one minute for everyone to conclude the meeting of today and tell us how to integrate biologists into those projects that you are organizing? Uh, first of all, is like a connection to what Edmund Husserl called the life world. So I speak as a philosopher now. We have a connection with an with a world that we are, and this connection in a way has been uh, cut, been lost in our contemporary society. Uh, biology meant in the sense that they try to delineate can be a way back to that, to that connection to the life world. In that sense, biology is fundamental also for design cities to providing a future. This, uh, it's a matter of uh, much more than simply design. It's about politics. It's about uh, the way we stay together, we share together life and together also with the, with the world we belong to. So it's a matter, it's a vital question. Biologists in that sense can really play a fundamental role in designing cities and uh, in perspective uh, what we should go ahead like as a common human human thank you thank you very much natalia well you know i would like to ask biologists the following now i have collaboration with uh, the institution in the city of Kazan and with our partners, we collaborate on different international projects dedicated to the city life. And we do not have enough papers and publication, publications which would be dedicated on biological necessities of human beings connected to contamination of the environment getting back to 1920s we they talk they talked about uh, the borders they researched um, and investigated city rural areas uh, its uh, integrity and uh, connection with uh, different species their functions now we have an opportunity and uh, tools, instruments, and me and my colleagues, we use different tools in order to analyze the work and the function of human brains. We'd like to have enough uh, publications dedicated to importance of beauty, dedicated to the importance of nature. Yes, we can add different topics, which you mentioned before, even like my colleagues, my colleagues said about 5G and it's, uh, say, it's safety. 
all those topics that we cover today is about the identity of the environment, about this impression of the comfort, about the opportunity to be in a system, a part of the system and live in harmony with the city. We do have lack of data of how um, does a human being really need this environment? What are the functions which are responsible for the necessity in aesthetics, in proportions, in golden section, in nature. Me personally, well, I'm, I listen to different lectures different on different topics, different biologists. They speak about wide range of topics. However, this biological school, which is needed, which could be connected to the research projects, which would could organize environment it will be so important thank you i invite you to our institution there are specific areas where the um, foundation of a city is being built there is a field an area an area which is ready to be used uh, for testing and for research, Irina, would you say something as well? From the point of view of a human being close to ecology. Yes, uh, we've listened about bioecology, about ecologists, and I think that indeed such, a speciali such specialists are vital and uh, they would uh, be able to do research work to understand better our environment, there are such papers. However, it's important to systematize them. This is my first observation, first direction. However, indeed, our colleagues underlined correctly. What does a human being need to be able to live in harmony? Well, we know that, but from different disciplines, however, to analyze the data and to say it should be done this way, in that way, and in th those ways, it's impossible. We should remember about individuality. However, bioecologists might be helpful for architects, for um, designers to prepare the environment to be to be in harmony with uh, everything, with the space, with housing, because there are different questions. Right now, we are in this room. Is it safe or is it not safe? What are the bacteria in this room? When the filters was were changed, I think that this is another area for research. Thank you. Thank you. The last word, and we have only, I see, only two minutes. Dear friends, may I not draw the line here because it's impossible. We cannot come to a conclusion. I'm repeating and repeating the words of Mr. Nalim, of academician biologist. What shall be done at the end of the game, of the card game? Well, we need to start playing a game. And I know only one solution. We need professionals profession, professionals who um, know how to listen to each other. One person can listen to ecologists, to the architect. We all have our roles and every role is needed. That is why your faculty is called life sciences. We need professionals about life sciences who are ready to listen to each other, to see biosemiotics, bio, bionics, ecological psychology, neuroarchaeology, all those areas, all those disciplines which go beyond the borders and create new aspects. That is why as soon as we prepare this, disciplines, the better it will be. I remember you asked, uh, Professor, you research the same species all of your life. You research 
wombs are you not born boards life is so short no that is why let us focus on cities cities which are enormous and thanks to each other we can ask direct questions for example today i was so happy listening to someone on the balcony they can go out spend some time find some plants eat, eat some leaves of plants or if i will approach to someone to ask directly tell me what's your fans and i will tell you who you are well that is why the dialogue starts and it's wonderful that the dialogue of life sciences cannot be concluded and it's wonderful that it is started in the institution of psychoanalysis on the faculty of life sciences with you Olga thank you thank you very much I would like to remind you to all of you that you will be able to attend further events of our lectorium under Moscow Institution of Psychoanalysis please go to the website sign up join to our discussion we plan to continue talking about this topics to create a common civic language will allow us to be able to hear each other and to find the harmony thank you for your attention thank you very much thank thanks to our experts thank you and uh,